Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the really kind um, introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I'm uh, welcome to our talk and today I'm, we're going to talk to you about um, the uh, SANS Instrument Suite and the SANS Group at the um, ISIS Neutron Source. So I'm going to start off uh, and then my colleagues Rob and Najet will uh, pick up after me. So here's just a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today, I guess which come as, as sort of no surprise. Um, we're going, to, I'm going to begin by talking about ISIS, the facility and time of flight SANS and talk about the SANS group and our SANS instruments. And then we'll give some science examples, talk about our sample environments, um, and then sort of the practical things about sort of how to get beam time if um, you were interested in performing some experiments here. And then finally, answering your questions. So first, we're going to talk about ISIS and time of flight SANS. So here's a bit about um, the ISIS facility. So we can see, you can see a map here on the right of um, the ISIS facility located in the UK. So the cities of uh, Bristol, Birmingham, and London, and um, our very nearby city of Oxford. So ISIS is the UK's neutron and muon facility. Um, we consider it a world leading center for research in physical and life sciences. So ISIS is operated by the, one of the UK's research councils, the STFC, um, and it's located at the Rutherford Appleton Lab, which is on the Harwell campus, which as I said is near Oxford. So several ways of producing neutrons, and ISIS produces neutrons um, via sort of um, a pulsed, it's a, a pulsed dissipation neutron source. And so the way it produces neutrons is by um, accelerating beams of protons into two tantalum targets, one each target station. And sort of uh, by the way that we produce neutrons, the wavelengths of the neutrons are separated for measurements by their time of flight. So here's the location of ISIS on the Rutherford Appleton Lab in the Harwell campus. So RAL itself hosts both the um, UK's neutron source ISIS, um, as well as the uh, third generation synchrotron diamond, um, as well as the central laser facility, which features um, Petswatt Laser Vulcan, um, and also includes other sort of RAL departments for things like space and scientific computing. But on the Harwell campus more generally, there's loads of stuff. So uh, includes other publicly funded research infrastructure, um, organizations sort of like uh, like the European Space Agency, um, also and also sort of lots of companies, so private sector organizations um, and sort of research labs from 30 UK universities. So if you want to talk with facility by numbers, here's just a brief overview of some things about ISIS. So we have um, five muon instruments, 29 neutron instruments, loads of visitors a year, um, and those visitors uh, submit to us from 34 countries, submit loads of proposals, and uh, come through a lot of experiments. So um, we have thousands of proposals, uh, five experiments here, and those are from a really wide areas, a range of sciences. So if you look here, um, last couple of years of our 600 publications, there's a lot of material science and sort of physics, but then other fields such as life sciences, engineering, heritage. Um, so we really cover a lot of areas of science, given our sort of different specialities of our scientists, but also um, of our instrumentation. So you can go to the next slide, Najets. Thank you. So if we kind of start drilling down into the facility, here's um, the overview you saw at the start, but here's the sort of annotated version. So this is the ISIS facility itself. So at the bottom right, you can see the linear accelerator where we start to produce protons. And then those are accelerated um, in the sort of the proton synchrotron, which is there under that sort of mound at the bottom. Um, and those protons are then sent off uh, once accelerated to two target stations, the original target station one, um, and the more recent target station two. And so now we're going to take a schematic view inside those buildings. And here's just an overview of the whole facility. So um, the first target station ISIS was commenced in 1984, um, operates at 40 hertz and 150 kilowatts. Um, and the second target station uh, was commenced in 2008 and operates at 10 hertz and 38 kilowatts. Um, with really, um, the second target station is really designed to take advantage of the, uh, the, kind of the, the long wavelength neutrons that are produced by the ISIS um, targets. So between these two target stations, we have four SANS instruments um, and they all do small angle scattering, but they have their each kind of differences in their design and their specialisms. And those instruments are low Q, which is on the first target station, three SANS instruments on the second target station, SANS 2D, Zoom, and Larmor. So I briefly want to just say a bit about time of flights um, because it's the, the way that we actually sort of measure our neutrons here at ISIS and that uh, kind of provides benefits for the experiments that we do. 
So what is time of flight? Well, neutrons at a uh, pulse ablation source are produced in pulses. And we um, once the neutrons come out of the moderator, they have a spread of wavelengths. And the time of flight from production of a pulse of neutrons to the time they're collected at the detector gives their velocity. And from their velocity, you can determine their energy. And from their energy, you can determine their wavelength. So in the figure there to the right, you see a wavelength spectrum from sans GD. So each pulse of the ISIS source produces um, a wavelength spread like this, and we use all those neutrons in our measurements. And why is collecting time of flight neutrons useful for SANS? Well, the magnitude of Q depends on both the scattering angle and wavelength. So if you collect a broad angle of wavelengths on a detector, you can get a very broad Q range, um, and you can measure that in one single instrument configuration. Um, and so time of flight SANS in particular um, not only allows you to collect um, over a broad Q range in one measurement, but also has better Q resolution over the whole of the Q range that you measure than monochromatic SANS. So if we figure here at the bottom, um, which is an example from um, a round robin, uh, so round robin uh, set of measurements done sort of 10 years or so ago. Um, and this shows SANS click on the same sort of supply of uh, latexes comparing on different instruments. So we see here data from uh, reactor sources. So the ILL, ANSTO, um, NIST, and in the sort of maroon points there, you see the measurement from SANS 2D. So that's measurement on SANS 2D at 12 meters, and that has a wider Q range on one single detector than monochromatic instruments on several instrument configurations. And that example, I think, really shows the advantage of time of flight SANS that in one single measurement with one instrument configuration, you can access a really broad Q range. So that's your first talk about my first talk about one of our SANS instruments, and I'm going to introduce the group and um, our instruments. So here's the SANS group. There's nine of us in the group. Um, our group uh, leader is Sarah, Sarah Rogers. Um, you've already seen Rob Nichette and I. Um, the members of the group are uh, Steve King, James Douch, Dirk Honecker, Leji Capacanti, Diego Albafanero, um, and myself. Um, and between us, we have a lot of, uh, we have interest in a lot of areas of science ranging from sort of life sciences and biosciences to soft materials to hard matter engineering materials to sort of instrument development and sort of, um, you know, neutron instrumentation development. Um, so I mean, the great thing about working in a, a large group with a lot of instruments and a large team is that we have a lot of, uh, we cover a lot of areas of science that you would use neutrons for. Um, so with our users, we often sort of, I'd say we find that we, uh, have some nice synergy with them. So now that's the group, and I'm going to briefly talk about our, our four instruments. So first here, the two, um, I'm going to talk about low Q first, which is the first SANS instrument at ISIS. Um, it's operated for nearly 30, well, for more than 35 years. It produced a sort of enormous amount of data sets and publications in its time. So low Q is quite a simple instrument. It's a fixed geometry, fixed sample detector system. It's sort of really quite fixed. Um, and it has wide Q range, being a top SANS instrument, but it's really best in intermediate Q. Um, it is still operational, but it's currently less used than the, the TS2 instruments. Um, so the next instrument on target station two was SANS 2D, and that's a second generation top SANS instrument. Um, the real so unique feature of it is this two large and independently movable area detectors. So when I refer to the 12 meter configuration earlier, that's because the detector in it can be, um, this, well, the main detector in it can be sort of moved to different positions. So because of this, it covers a really wide Q range in a single setting. Um, but particularly because of its 12 meter configuration, it achieves the lowest Q values that we can access at ISIS. And um, just due to its sort of design has an especially low background. Um, we'll see it later, but uh, in addition to SANS, um, it's also capable of doing grazing incidents, SANS. And here are our other two SANS instruments, Zoom and LAMRA. So Zoom is quite flexible, high count rates, top SANS instrument. Um, it also has the capability to do polarized SANS. Um, it features a high capacity, um, for access sample stage for putting kind of various sample environments in. Um, and uh, befitting its name, um, a sort of future development working on with Zoom is the ability to do uh, vSANS or very small angle neutron scattering, and that would reach even lower Q than the instrument currently can. And we use that doing compound refractive lenses. And then our final SANS instrument is um, LAMRA, which is, again is a sort of a flexible instrument that's kind of in its simplest form can do um, high throughput top sands, but um, also as befitting its name, um, it's uh, used for the development of uh, LAMRA precession techniques. And there's a variety of these, but it's probably the ones that have been most used in the facility thus far are uh, spin echo sands and spin echo modulated sands. I'll talk about those more at the end of this section, but um, those probably the ability to access 
much longer length scales than conventional sands, up to sort of 10 microns. Um, the, just due to the sort of arrangement of LAMR, um, also its detector sort of table can be rotated and that permits you, makes it possible to do sort of things like high angle, uh, high resolution rather, uh, diffraction measurements. So I guess this is the sort of useful sort of list of specs for our uh, instruments. So these are the Q ranges that the different instruments can access in their um, sort of standard configurations. So we cover, depending on the instrument, we cover um, a wide range of Q ranges. But the thing I the really emphasize is that because these are top sands instruments, all of these Q ranges are in a single instrument configuration. So that's these are the Q ranges as um, they currently are, but uh, lower Q will be accessible in the future on Zoom with the, the vSANS upgrade. Um, and longer length scales, not Q, and you'll see why in a minute, are accessible on LOMR using Spinecho SANS. And so the reason that I've spun Spinecho SANS out is because um, it's, a real, it's a real space SANS technique, really. So, um, so I'll briefly just kind of go over uh, Spinecho SANS or CSANS. Um, as it's uh, quite a, a unique capability that we have on the instrument here. So you, um, you can see sort of LOMR set up for CSANS in the picture there at the top. Um, and SpinEcho SANS basically takes advantage of the, the use of, of SpinEcho. So um, incoming neutrons are processed the same number of times before, well, before and after the sample. So processed in one way, go through the sample, and the same number of processions in the other way. So um, when you're actually doing a measurement, what you're looking to see is um, any, any small amount of scattering will reduce the sort of amount of neutrons that are polarized at the detector. And a decrease in polarization you can relate to some scattering. So that's the instrument there at the top, um, as well as the sort of layouts of the kind of all the magnetic systems in CSANS mode. But I think the thing to, is really interesting to look at is the CSANS data, which when you're used to reciprocal space scattering is um, a bit alarming because we're now in real space. So we've plotted here um, basically sort of correlation function measured by CSANS as a function of the spin echo length. So we have measurements here of nearly up to 25 microns. So that's um, why CSANS really be used to access longer length scales. And we have here measurements of the grating. And if you look at it, you can really see the regular spacing between the um, positions of the grating. And so that's measured using several instrument uh, configurations, uh, several CSANS instrument configurations on Bomber. So we've been doing a lot of work on this setup recently um, to both improve its stability and reproducibility. Um, and we've had some really uh, kind of nice results of that work. And we're taking on a recommissioning program to really understand and define the limits of that technique and also to compare its performance to kind of a currently existing um, CSAN system at TU Delft. Um, but so far, these are kind of currently the only two sort of operational CSAN instruments there are, um, and the CSANS of Mount Lama is quite unique for being a, a top CSANS instrument. Um, I guess one thing just to point out, which is useful, especially if you've come to using CSANS as a sort of SANS user, is that uh, there's been work done in sort of scanning putting software like SASView to be able to fit CSANS data using the exact same models that you would use with SANS. So thank you, Nishat. I think um, that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. So I'm going to now hand over to Jet, who's going to talk to you a bit about some of the science that we've done. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so uh, Greg told you about the um, suite of instruments that we have, and the, he mentioned a bit the variety of science that we do. And I will, in the next few minutes, I will um, give you um, a few examples, or I will tell you about a few examples of the science that uh, we do at ISIS. Uh, given my background, I will start with the um, um, bioscience examples, and then I will move slowly to more um, um, uh, physics examples that are a bit too complex for me to explain. So if you have any question, please ask Rob uh, about them or Greg. The bio ones, you're welcome to ask me. Uh, so the first example that I will um, tell you about, if I can um, get the screen to move. Yeah, here it is. Here we go. Um, so the first example uh, that I will tell you about is the, the, how we determine the molecular structure of human immunoglobulin uh, uh, 3. So um, immunoglobulins are um, um, the most abundant um, antibodies. Uh, immunoglobulin Gs are the most abundant um, um, antibodies in the human serum. There are four of them. Uh, we know uh, the molecular structure of three of them, but the one that we don't know the molecular structure of is um, IgG3. 
the reason for that is uh, can be um, found here is because of this. So IgGs are uh, formed of uh, two fab regions, as you can he see here, and an FC region. So the FC region is basically um, the region that interacts with the receptors on cells, and um, and the uh, and the fab regions are the antigen ones. Uh, the reason for no for us not knowing the crystal structure of um, IgG3 is the fact that this hinge region that connects the two, the fab and the FC is very long, so it's 62 amino acid, but mostly it has, um, uh, it has um, an enormous number of, um, of, um, of disulfide bonds. So that's the reason for it. And um, um, uh, the approach that um, uh, um, uh, one of the PhD, one of the ISIS PhD student took to doing this is basically to uh, use low resolution uh, techniques with atomistic modeling. So for that, we used SANS2D and we exploited the low background on SANS2D. We used SACS on um, the BioSax beamline B21 at Diamond and um, um, analytical ultra centrifugation. And we combined that with, uh, uh, with atomistic modeling. We used um, a molecular dynamics and a Monte Carlo simulation. And um, doing that, uh, we looked at both glycosylated and deglycosylated uh, uh, and deglycosylated um, um, IgG, and we were able basically to determine uh, the structure or the molecular structure of um, IgG3. What we saw uh, when uh, determining the structure is basically the hinge is semi-rigid, and 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 and, and the FT regions. And um, the fab regions are not very flexible. Um, we using the same approach. We also look or using the same approach. Valentina, the PhD student, also looked at the structure of IgG1. And in this case, um, the aim was mostly to look at the impact of glycosylation and deglycosylation of um, uh, uh, of IgG1. So IgG1, we already have the molecular structure of it. Uh, uh, and it has a short hinge. So the, 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 the hinge is only about 15 um, amino acids. So it's quite a short one and it has fewer um, um, SS bonds. So she looked at the, at the structure and using exactly the same approach. Basically, she saw that uh, um, the deglycosylating the, uh, the, the, the IgG1 uh, makes it really very uh, flexible, and that is, that impacts on its interaction with um, uh, the FC receptors, uh, and that um, and, and and that work resulted in this beautiful um, ND Warhol type of of, uh, of a front cover of biophysical journals. So I like uh, showing this off. So it's it's basically um, um, yeah, it tells you. Uh, I mean, SANS is is I mean. We, we, we all know it's a low resolution uh, technique and, and, and with proteins, we don't often get uh, beautiful data out of it. But here, using both um, uh, um, SENS2D and its low background and combining it with SACS and uh, um, analytical intra, intra centrifugation atomistic modeling, we uh, produce these uh, um, beautiful structures here. Um, the second example I will talk about is lipid nanoparticles. They are everywhere, especially with the with the with the mRNA vaccines that we had uh, for COVID nineteen. So this work on lipid nanoparticle was done in collaboration with um, AstraZeneca. So this is not um, um, LMPs for uh, for vaccines, but it's LMPs for uh, cancer uh, for cancer treatment. So this work started a few um, a few years ago. We started looking at the structure of lipid nanoparticles and especially the location of the di different lipids within lipid nanoparticles and their interaction with mRNA. So we know that lipid nanoparticles are made of four components. So we have um, an, ionic, an, an ionizable cationic lipids that basically that's the one lipid that made the use of LMPs in um, the clinical use of LMPs possible. So we have that that um, um, that lipid, the ICL, and we have what we call a helper lipid. It's usually a phospholipid, and in this case, it's a DSPC. And we have um, 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 a third 
lipid that is a peg lipid. So he, usually it's a DMG uh, peg lipid, a, 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 peg, a peg 2000. And obviously we have the mRNA. So we mix uh, and, and cholesterol, of, uh, um, of course. So there are four lipids and mRNA. So we mix them. The mixing is usually done using um, uh, microfluidics. So what, what happened is you will, um, you will prepare your mRNA in, in a buffer at acidic pH, and you will prepare your um, uh, lipid mix in ethanol, and then you will mix them at a flow of one to three. And then you will end up with particles that, are, that have a diameter of about um, 100 nanometers for uh, uh, like um, an optimal uh, delivery into the cytosol. So in this, um, in this work, what AstraZeneca wanted to look at is um, uh, because of the use of the of the of the of the automatic or the automated um, 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 of, of the of the standard uh, production route is quite complex. They wanted to use an automated platform that they used before for testing lipids, and they wanted to see the difference between the two um, uh, the two um, um, uh, type of. of, of the, the, the particle from two different platforms. And what we notice is basically the, the automated LMPs have a better performance uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in vivo and in vitro. And, uh, and, they, and they benefit or they, they have a better delivery of mRNA uh, to, the, to, the, to the cytosol. This we think is due to the fact that the automated LM LMPs that accommodate more, more mRNA per, per particle, but they also possess more hydrophobic surface and they are more hemolytic and they bind a larger protein corona and that's mainly APOE um, or Apo, uh, Apo lipoprotein E and they accumulate more in the <coughs> micropinocytosomes. Uh, so we looked at the structure of Basically, the, the um, using sands and sacs in combination, and 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 and, and complementing that with DLS and cryoEM allowed us to uh, come to the conclusion that basically these property impact the cytosol delivery of these lipid nanoparticles. Um, the third example I will show it's more to talk about the resolution actually. On, on, on the science instrument and mostly the resolution on science today. And this is obviously um, needed for systems like liquid crystalline systems, monodispersed systems, as you can see here, but also multi-component system. So multi-component systems like this um, 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 liquid crystalline nanoparticles that have um, uh, two types of lipids in it and um, and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a and a surfactant to stabilize it. So using contrast variation here, we were um, able basically to separate the Bragg peak, the diffraction peak, which is basically characterizes the internal structure of the core shell particle that we form with these lipids, and varying the concentration of of, of the um, and increasing the concentration of this surfactant induces a kind of, a, induces basically a phase separation within the system and displaces some of the lipids from, um, it's basically concentrates the amount of lipids in the core and displaces and causes a phase separation between um, uh, the, 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 the PIT micelle and the second lipid to the, to the, to, to the shell and that impacts the delivery of the, of the of, uh, that impacts the structure, obviously, but also the delivery of, of, of hydrophobic or hydrophilic um, small molecule that you want uh, uh, to deliver using this um, um, uh, liquid crystalline nanoparticles. Uh, I don't know how much I'm, how I'm doing in terms of time. So yeah, my um, fourth example is about skyrimions. And here is basically to, um, the aim is to, show you how um, um, the, 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 the time scales that we can achieve using event mode on the science instruments at ISIS. And the, using event mode, obviously we can, <clears throat> here we, we, we looked at um, um, the relaxations and the reorientation of skirmions in, um, um, 
um, manganese monosilicide, which is um, what we call a, a, the archetypical chiral magnet. And here <clears throat> we looked at them, which is basically it has a helical structure with right-handed and left-handed uh, chiralities. And here by applying um, 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 a magnetic field, we could we could look we could see that basically the the change in the in the and while the magnetic field was kept constant uh, and applied along the, the 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 beam axis when we do a rotation of the of the crystal of 55 degrees and we measure we see a reorientation basically happening uh, on the second time scales and <clears throat> and and this 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 behavior is Obviously, uh, uh, this can shed light on, on, on the interactions of the skirmion phase with the crystalline lattice. Um, the next example, um, back to surfactants or soft matter, and this is basically what we do a lot of, especially on low Q. And this work I'm showing here was work that was done uh, on low Q. And here, um, a group from uh, Bristol University looked at them formation of, um, um, of SDS, um, 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 fractal aggregates and fractal gels um, in, um, in deep eutectic solvents. And these, gel, these gels form via um, 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 uh, counter ion condensation. So this deep eutectic solvent, solvent um, uh, glycerin is, an, is, a, is an, a green non-aqueous DES, which has um, um, potential industrial applications. It's actually this work was done in collaboration with GSK. And with using SANS, we confirmed the pre presence of, 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 of fractal aggregates. And these uh, fractal aggregates, actually, they form due to condensation of the uh, colline ion around the STS fractal aggregates, as you can see it here from the, from the SANS data and here. On this sketch, you can see basically the 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 the, the, the process of formation of this uh, fractal dendrites. Um, my fifth example, I think, is comes from Zoom. This is actually the first paper that came out of, of experiments on Zoom. It was an express uh, measurement. Here we looked at uh, at the formation about of, of this um um polycatenine diform from um, toroidal uh, um, um, building blocks. And uh, you can see here, um, I mean, they look similar to, um, to Olympic rings. It's like there are five of them. Uh, and, um, uh, and using sands and sacks, um, contrast variation sands and sacks, we could confirm basically the, 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 uh, the model that was developed uh, from IFM, and I think um, there are there's so much detail on the slide. That you you don't need me to tell you uh, uh, the details of how it's um, uh, of how it works. Um, the last example I will tell you about is basically the use of um, GI science on on Sense TV, and um, the one thing I will say is basically um, um, the the big advantage of of, of using a um, um, of, of doing tough GI sands is the fact that you get um, a, a depth dependence because of, of because we, we we get all the wavelength and that gives us information about grazing incidents near surface and the bulk properties of the system and here you can see uh, the crystalline structure um, in I think a 10 angstrom in depth of um, a surfactant uh, 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 um, concentrated film on, uh, on, 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 on a surface. I think that's about it for me. Now Rob will tell you about sample environments and support labs and, uh, and, um, and the different routes of access. And, um, and I think that's about it. Thanks, Anjit. <laughs> if you have any questions about those things, obviously, uh, then come back to us at the end. So um, the organisation of, of the support groups at ISIS is slightly different to, to some places, but essentially it's based around uh, specialised teams. So we have uh, a dedicated team for soft matter sample environment. They don't actually just look after soft matter sample environment. They also look after some uh, cryomagnets and, and other equipment for hard matter as well. 
So it's a slightly misleading name. There's a team of four of them, uh, and they're supported by the other specialist teams in cryogenics, furnaces, and electronics um, to enable us to deliver the program. They do a fantastic job. So for SANS, um, they, they look after a, a large suite of uh, standard sample environment, including water baths, and there are sample changes, which I'll come back to in a minute. And they also help us to develop new things. So Nijet was telling us today about a new piece of equipment they're developing for us where we'll be able to expose samples to uh, light in an automated way to, to control reactions. They also look after the equipment for the reflectometers. Uh, so that, that includes uh, things like uh, Langmuir uh, blodgett troughs and things like that, which are somewhat more specialized. But it does mean they're a little bit stretched at times. Uh, so they're, they're providing support and allowing and helping us to install equipment on both the SANS instruments and the reflectometers. So on target station two alone, uh, that's already basically five instruments. Um, so we have to be quite careful to, to keep them on side. Um, the thing that won't come up later that's on this list, sorry, you can just go back one, um, is the 3D vector magnet, um, which we didn't actually include on another slide, but the, the work that was shown earlier with the manganese silicide um, was done in this 3D vector magnet, which enables us to uh, trace out a, um, a magnetic field vector in, in any direction and to control that uh, relative to Q. Um, that's something we're exploring more and more at the moment, particularly with these uh, topological systems. Okay, sorry, you can go on now. Um, so in a bit more detail, um, we have our standard sample changes. Um, each of the instruments has one of these. Uh, in the case of the target station two instruments, they can contain up to 40 samples. Uh, and that's needed because sometimes our data collection times are around 10, 10 to 15 minutes. So to put everything together for an overnight run, we need the 40 samples uh, in all those positions to, to get through the night. Each of the decks can be independently temperature controlled. So there's an upper and lower deck on the target station two instruments and low Q only has one. We also have the ability to install heating rods so we can take these things up to, up to a couple of hundred degrees for, for polymer work. Uh, we then also have a couple of uh, cells which involve the use of a, a Lincam heater stage. So this is something that uh, is a fairly common piece of equipment in particularly polymer labs in the UK, uh, developed by a UK company. And it's, it's basically a, a very small and very well uh, controlled heating um, stage that we've inserted into a vacuum box to enable us to do very highly controlled ramping rate uh, experiments with um, with samples. We have two of these we can put on the beamline at any given time and we can evacuate them or backfill them with, with gas. Um, there's a couple of rheometers uh, now um, and these are the, the sort of uh, preserve of Najet and James and Steve, um, but they produce beautiful data. Um, and we, the new one that we have is currently being commissioned. Um, and there's an older bowling one, which uh, if you did require one, two plane experiments, we could resurrect, but it will take quite a bit of work. Uh, finally, on this slide, the Thar pressure cell is something that Sarah Rogers developed uh, over uh, much of her early career here at ISIS in collaboration with her old group in, in Bristol with Julian Easto. So this is specifically designed for looking at supercritical CO2 systems, um, and it has the ability to um, obviously create supercritical CO2 and look at that as a, a green surfactant uh, or an, an environment for green uh, chemistry. Uh, we can then move on to some of the stuff uh, we were touched on earlier when we were talking in Renal. Um, so we, we do have a number of different bits of equipment for looking at secondary characterization. Um, the NERF cell was developed in collaboration with Adrian Rennie in Sweden and, and Cedric Dicko at the, uh, the University of Lund. And this enables us to use um, a 3D printed um, holder that uh, has a, contains a, a flow through cell. And we can bring in uh, UV uh, phys, uh, spectrum and spectroscopy and also fluorescent spectroscopy into that to measure that simultaneously with the sands. And when we flow material through here, we also have the capability to um, measure the uh, the, the fluids that are coming through with a densitometer if required. So we can do have a cross-check 
to, to look at how uh, the mixing has been done when we've used uh, either a, an HPLC pump or some uh, syringe pump system to pump the uh, samples through. We then have a DLS um, to measure simultaneously, and this will be installed again on Sandstudy on Friday. Um, so again, this is a, a piece of equipment that was developed um, to, to operate simultaneously um, and is more or less routinely used, but hasn't been used so much in recent years. But if you do want to use it, then uh, obviously a careful um, discussion with the instrument scientists is, is necessary. Something that will come later this year is size exclu exclusion chromatography, sorry, SANS, which uh, is something that Najet and James have been developing, particularly for biosystems. So this allows us to uh, perform size exclusion chromatography on the materials before they're injected into the, the beamline in order to in, enhance the uniformity and reliability of the measurement. Uh, so previously, particularly with biological materials, we were finding that the things that got to the beamline were not what people thought they were. Uh, so these things have been developed in order to significantly improve the performance of, of SANS with uh, biological materials. Finally on here, the 17 Tesla magnet uh, is something that again is fairly specialized and has to be actually brought here uh, specifically if you, if you want to go up to those very large fields. The standard magnets we have are uh, seven Tesla and now a, uh, a three Tesla magnet, which enables us to transport a polarized beam through it for polarized um, neutron sands measurements. Okay. Uh, and then coming back to the, the other support teams that we have, uh, there is a lot of other standard sample environment equipment at, at ISIS that's been developed over, over the years. Uh, optical furnaces uh, developed um, in collaboration largely with the muon groups, but uh, are available for SANS uh, and reflectometry as well. The vacuum furnace, traditional vacuum furnaces for neutron scattering, there's, there's a whole ream of those available. Uh, cryo furnaces, CCRs, there are plenty of. Um, so if you, you need to uh, get down to controlled lower temperatures, there are plenty of ways to do that. Wet and um, recirculating cryostats exist, and these and many of these can be inserted into different magnets that we have. As I mentioned just now, the, the screw conducting seven and a half Tesla magnet is a piece of standard equipment. And finally, gas handling. Um, so, if you want uh, exotic gas mixing environments, those can also be um, be utilised through one of the specialist uh, support groups at the facility. Uh, I should also just mention actually the lowest temperatures we can achieve uh, for SANS at the moment. Uh, we don't have a dilution fridge option. So uh, if you wanted to do millikelvin, that's something that uh, we're looking towards developing, but really we're, we're sort of stuck at about two Kelvin at the moment. Okay. Sorry, did you move on now? Um, so finally, we have the support laboratories, and um, we had visitors actually from NIST at the start of this cycle, and they were extremely surprised by um, the, the level of support we have, particularly in our chemistry labs. Um, if you need support for manufacturing samples at the facility, then um, the team that run those labs are very happy to help. They're happy to coordinate bringing chemicals here, uh, transporting uh, equipment and chemicals to the labs as required. Um, but as a standard, we have a lot of um, just standard laboratory chemicals. There are fume hoods, glove boxes, vacuum ovens, um, and just standard uh, things that you would expect to find in, in any university chemistry lab. Uh, but it's always worth discussing with us if, if, if there's anything specific and more specialist as to whether we have it. The biolab is something that is um, very much at the heart of what Najet does, and she um, has been running it for the last couple of years while the, um, the person who was running it uh, was replaced. Um, so there's a lot of additional characterization equipment within that lab to enable you, the people to uh, manufacture biological samples prior to them going on the beamline. So uh, it's class two, I think be capable of jet I can't remember class two bio lab yeah so we can't do anything really nasty but we can do some slightly nasty things 
there is also uh, a materials characterization lab, which is external to the main hall, but uh, is run as a support facility. So if you have an experimental analysis, but you want to cross check your samples with say X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence, DSC, AFM, there is the ability to do that as part of uh, a proposal. Um, so you, as, as long as we know you want to do it, we can arrange for training and to book that time in uh, for you to do that while you're here. And then finally, we have the deuteration facility, which um, is a mechanism by which we can produce for you um, certain deuterated chemicals. Again, this is something that tends to go through uh, the proposal system. So if you have particular needs for uh, deuterated chemicals, the earlier you communicate that to us, the better, and we can enter a discussion with the, the, the team in the deuteration lab to establish whether you, we can do the production of those materials for you or not. Um, often though, they actually carry a stock of quite a lot of uh, more uh, simple surfactant-like and lipid-like chemicals that can be um, leveraged for experiments. Okay. And finally, on to the beam time application process. Um, so uh, as a standard, we have the sort of typical uh, type of system for these facilities. We have two main proposal rounds a year in which you submit a, uh, a two-page justification for your request for beam time, along with a lot of other information to do with the samples and uh, mechanisms of funding and other things that information that's gathered for our funders. Uh, the two proposal rounds are typically April and October, and the any time grant, so that then the access panels meet in June and December, and so time from those panels is typically um, given and maybe two to three months, starting in a block two to three months after those, those rounds. So you would expect time from the June round to be scheduled in the autumn fall of the rest of that year. And then from the December round from sort of March through um, to, to August type time uh, throughout the, the course of the year, that's fairly standard. Um, so we can just go on to the next one. Um, so there are three uh, types of access that are mainly accessible to non-UK people. Uh, the direct access is the one I've essentially just described where you would put in a two-page proposal and that would be peer-reviewed by our access panels and then scheduled three to eight months after the proposal deadline. Um, rapid access is then a mechanism by which you can submit directly um, and the, the proposals will be reviewed by the internal teams, but then also submitted to members of the access panel. Um, it's slightly lighter touch, but is, ex in, is largely anticipated to be for things that are, are urgent. So say you're coming to the end of a PhD or NIST has just lost its reactor and you need to get time. Um, then uh, that sort of route might be um, might be applicable here. And then finally, the express uh, route that Najet mentioned in passing for Zoom is, is a postal system. So if your samples can be shipped uh, postally uh, or prepared reasonably simply at this end and uh, will work at preferably room temperature, um, under sort of reasonably undemanding conditions, then we can do uh, postal uh, stuff. This is not for things where we need a 17 Tesla magnet and two Kelvin. Um, it's, it's really for more standard um, checks to see whether things are gonna work if you then put in a full proposal. Um, finally, there are industrial routes as well, but those have to be linked to UK industry uh, and obviously there's a commercial route as well. So if you wanted to pay outright um, for time, you can do that. Um, but typically that would be something you wanted to protect the, I the IP on uh, and, and lock the data down. Okay. So the, the proposal system is, is, obviously you can find it through the main ISIS website. Uh, you can go through this link for users or on the main front page, there should be this nice click here to apply for beam time banner. And that will then take you through uh, into the system. You obviously have to log on and create an account and then it should be relatively straightforward from then on to, to follow the system through. It's fairly self-explanatory, uh, although there are an awful lot of questions. 
um, the rounds um, get locked when they're not open. So you won't be able to click on something that you, you can't access. Um, so it should be fairly self-explanatory as you go through. And I think that's it, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> That's all right. I did, did remember what we were doing. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, and any questions? <laughs>